Father, we thank you for your goodness. We pray that you would guide, direct and bless us. We thank you for the privilege of gathering together on your Sabbath day. And we ask for a blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. In our study yesterday, we discussed two concepts. We looked at the concept of ideology and humanism. We also discussed, perhaps in a different way than you're used to, the idea and concept of parables. And I try to remind us all of the various rules and concepts that are connected with parable teaching. So we went from ideology and humanism to human rights. And I briefly mentioned it but didn't go into any details that in 1948 we had what was called the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It's here on the board. Now I said that this declaration was put together by the United Nations, but the United Nations didn't really exist back in 1948. but it's a close enough approximation to use that term. And I said the reason that this declaration was put together was to was connected to the Second World War. Essentially, it was a statement that the framers hoped would prevent another world war. And depending upon one's perspective, we could argue whether or not that was successful or not. The person who drove this document through, who was, if we might say, the architect, that person was Eleanor Roosevelt. We all know that she was the wife of the uh, ex-president. So they got a number of member states, I believe the number was 18, they all came together and they wanted to create a statement or a set of values. So the United Nations General Assembly created this group this Commission on Human Rights to create this statement of a value system for the world. It begins in 1947. President Roosevelt has died. And it's, her, it's her, his widow, Eleanor, who's going to be the driving force for this, um, we'll call it this document, this statement. They, pro 
produce the document really quickly considering how difficult it is to get anybody to, to agree on anything. And I think it's adopted in December 1948. So it's first proposed in 46, they put the group together in 47, and it's completed in 48. So it takes two years to create this statement. And there are 30 articles or 30 separate statements about the rights of a human being. And I think those statements have been have been well established over the past 70 years. They've stood the test of time, if we can say it that way. Now in our study yesterday, we spoke about the French and the American revolutions. We connected those two revolutions to the book of Revelation. I gave the chapters here. And it's dealing with the United States and France. And we allowed parable teaching to turn things upside down, back to front. We have inspired statements to say who is good and who is bad. The United States is good, France is bad. According to inspiration. Because it definitely says that that great city is like Egypt and Sodom. And whatever that might mean to you, it's a pejorative term. It's, it's not nice. The United States is a beautiful lamb-like creature. That rises gracefully from the earth. So we took all of that modelling, put it to one side and turned it round. I can try to persuade you of the veracity, of the truthfulness of doing this. But at the end of the day, you have to decide for yourself. Now I can use various techniques to try to persuade you. In fact, I guess I would argue it's my job to do that. Someone asked me, I'm going to go into Greek and Latin this camp meeting. And I don't like to disappoint. So let's do a little bit. So, as I said, it's my job to try to persuade you. 
which means I need to use certain techniques to do so. So I hope you're all comfortable with me manipulating you. And I hope you won't find that offensive. Because we all do it. You do it. And therefore I will as well. So, I'm going to take the place of being the following. My pronunciation isn't very good. I'm going to be I'm going to be, I don't know how to pronounce this, a rhetor. Now, a rhetor is a Greek word. And it means a teacher. A teacher of... Um, A teacher who wants to portray an idea. Now there are good teachers and bad teachers. So what each of us need to do is learn the art or the technique. So when you get a teacher who's going to try to teach you something, they need to have a technique. Let's try and spell technique correctly. Technique. So when you get a rhetor and they use a technique, You end up with what? With rhetoric. So the word rhetoric that you're all familiar with it goes from Greek to Latin to French to English And each language has its slight variation. So the word rhetoric that you're all familiar with comes from two words. So this is the teacher and this is the technique or we'll call it the art. So if you do rhetoric that is the art of the teacher who uses a certain technique. So, so rhetoric, let's give a definition now. So we want to have, have the concept of art or skill. So, so that's one point. And then there's the vehicle, the mechanism. You can speak or you can write. And then there's the third concept of effective. So there's an art, there's effectiveness, and then there's the mode. So if you want to be a good teacher, 
you need to use rhetoric and rhetoric is the following it's the art of effective or persuasive speaking or writing so rhetoric is the art of using speech or writing effectively to communicate whatever you want to and it's supposed to be persuasive you need to impress your audience your audience of how clever you are now often today when we talk about rhetoric it can have a negative connotation to it as though the person who has rhetoric is not sincere or they're not genuine but that's just the narrow definition so I want to use it in its most general and generous term we all need to learn the art of effective speaking and writing which means you need to understand rhetoric and be rhetors now when you use rhetoric or when you employ it one of the mechanisms that you will use, one of the techniques is to use figures of speech and what's the other word or another word for figure of speech? parables of course so if you become skilled in the art of parable teaching then you will be recognized as being an expert in rhetoric this is one of the reasons why people begin to call Jesus rabbi or master or teacher rabbi master teacher because they recognize he's using the technique of a teacher now by the time you get to the history of Jesus, the New Testament you have some problems you have problems disengaging Judaism or Israel from Greek philosophy <coughs> over the centuries leading up to the time of Christ if we use the words of Paul worldly wisdom and religion have merged so when Paul tries to argue with the Greeks at the same time he uses Greek logic and Greek wisdom and even though he calls those Greek philosophers foolish for worshipping an unknown God
if you study his writings, Paul's writings, you'll see how he continues to merge rhetoric and Jewish theology. And that's why he's so, depending on your perspective, that's why he's so interesting and that's why he's so difficult to understand. What makes him such a powerful speaker is that he has harnessed the power of rhetoric. So, I hope we all now have some kind of working knowledge of rhetoric. And why it's so important and more than that, that if you're going to use parable teachings, you are really using rhetorical techniques. It's just that if you're Christians like us, parables don't sound offensive, but rhetoric sounds too worldly. Now, if you're going to use rhetoric, you're going to use this technique. So, rhetoric is argument. Let's use the word argument. Not just argument like a fight. This is reasoned argument. So, a reasoned argument is rhetoric. Now, if you're going to use rhetoric properly, let me step back. We have said that rhetoric is reasoned argument. I want to use a more gentle word because people might not like argument. I'm going to use the word persuasion. So rhetoric is the art of persuasion. Now you might not realise it, but there is nothing new under the sun. And I can assure you that when you try to speak with people to persuade them, you will use certain techniques and you will do that subconsciously. Now as you're looking at me you will notice I use facial expressions and I use my body, or we call it body language If I try to tie my hands up, it becomes very difficult to communicate well. Now, in our movement, because we're conservatives, we have been very scared to talk about what I will call worldly techniques. But I want, what I want to suggest to you is 
all the Greeks did was the following. They looked at human beings and described them. And when they described them with these Greek words, thousands of years later, when we look at them, we get scared. Because the Bible says, these Greek philosophers are dangerous. The wisdom of the world. And that sounds scary. So when you use rhetoric, there are three things that you will use. I'm sure that some of you know them. The first one is Logos or Logos. So you have to use Logos. Then you have to use Ethos. And I'm sure you all know the third one. Pathos. So, if you're going to learn the art of persuasion, it has three components to it. Logos, ethos, pathos. And you may not realise it, but the reason you have certain favourite speakers is because intuitively you are aware of these three things. And the persuasive teacher who has learnt the art of persuasion whether they have studied or not, they have understood how to harness these three things. You might wonder why I'm talking about all of this. In English, there's a, there's a saying, a phrase. And I think it's more true than people appreciate. It's not what you say, and you can finish the rest. It's the way you say it. Now, whilst you may say that's not completely true, You can see, if you look at this way of thinking, there is a lot of truth to that. So, pathos, I think we all know what pathos is. It's something that we say that we shouldn't do. We shouldn't pull upon the heartstrings of our audience. We should be clinical and logical. We shouldn't try to elicit emotional responses from people. I'll use a, an English phrase. Don't do a guilt trip on people. Does that, do people know what I mean? Yeah? Don't make people feel guilty. That's exactly what John the Baptist does. 
He's an expert on pathos. That's the first angel. He makes you feel bad. Now, Logos is not exactly logic, but let's just go with that. Is John the Baptist very logical? No. He's actually got a lot of his theology wrong. But he's got a lot of pathos. Manipulating people's emotions, making them feel bad. And we might not like to hear this. But he's, he's using false theology to do it. Jesus, the Messiah, is going to come and kill you if you don't get your act together. And this is why John is so disappointed when he goes into prison. Because Jesus has to correct his theology. Okay, so I want to argue, John is an expert on pathos. Now, ethos is a bit more esoteric to try to understand. I've tried to give a simplified explanation of what ethos means. Now, John had a lot of ethos. Ethos means, if you think about ethics, ethics and ethos. Ethos is about your ideals. It's about your guiding beliefs. So, if you think about ethos as your morality, your moral framework. So, we'll say pathos is feelings. Ethos is, we'll call it your morality. And then we'll go to Logos. So what does Logos mean? Now this is quite interesting. Because you know, hopefully, that the New Testament was written really in Greek, not Hebrew. And what's even more interesting is that when they quote from the Old Testament, that is the Greek Old Testament that they quote from. And the King James translators had a real problem. What, what was their problem? Was the following. If you go to the book of John. Chapter 1 verse 1. You get a problem. I think you all know what the problem is. Verse, chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the problem is, when that was written, when it says Word, 
That was Logos. In the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos was, sorry, and the, and the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. So, this Greek word Logos is God, and it's also the incarnate God. And what does all that even mean? So, this Greek word is complex, to say the least. So, if we want to try to just get a simple understanding of what Logos is, if you go to the New Testament, it just means the Word. But we want to say it's reason. You might say that it's logic. So that's what we want to understand the Logos to be. Perhaps another word we'll put with it is... Opinion. Now, if I start giving my opinion, my reason, I use another word, account. Okay, so the word account means means my version. So logos means reason, it means opinion, it means my account, my version. So we need that, then you need a moral framework, and then you need to elicit feelings to the person you're speaking to. And to be an effective teacher of persuasion, you need to combine all of these Now what's the problem with all of this? Because there is an underlying problem. When we start speaking about rhetoric And we start breaking down rhetoric into its three components. You begin to get into problems. Now, me, the rhetor, I want to elicit a response in you. I want you to feel good or I want you to feel bad. And I can do that. And the reality is, you had very little power to resist my charms. Less than you think. Because the fact that you sit and listen exposes you. We're told 
that Satan or Lucifer is very clever, very powerful. And the reason you should not engage with him or tangle with him is because he knows you better than you know yourself. And one of the things he knows about you better than you know yourself is what? What does he know more about you than you know about yourself? Let me see if I can find a Bible first. I'm probably not going to be able to find it, so I'll do plan B. Oh, found it. First, First Corinthians ten thirteen. First Corinthians ten thirteen. We ready? You are tempted in the same way that everyone else is tempted. So you're tempted in the same way everyone else is. Another way to say it. No temptation has overtaken you that is unusual for humans. What does it say on the board? You're not special. And your problem is you think you're special. You think you're different. You think you're unique. And it's this inbuilt concept of individuality that is our weakness. It exposes you to great danger. You think you can escape my powers. That you're special. Other people might get deceived by me, but you won't. Now, as I said, Satan is very clever. But he's not the only clever person. These Greeks were clever too. And they know if we just say through contemplation, meditation and observation contemplation, meditation, observation like John the Baptist they studied human beings. They were philosophers. And all they're doing is writing down or codifying human experience. It's right here. 
And so, a speaker will create feelings in you and you are powerless to resist. If they're good at their job. So, if you want to persuade people, you need to create feelings. So that depends on, upon how you speak. Then, not only, do you, sorry, not only do you have to have feelings, I have to have feelings. I have to speak with feelings, emotions, pathos. If I cry, if I cry, you cry. That's a biblical principle. Weep with those who weep. Laugh with those who laugh. What did Paul say? When I was with the Romans, I was a what? A Roman. When I was with the Jews, I was a Jew. That's pathos. You might call it hypocrisy. I call it pathos. Then you need to have some moral framework, some moral compass. Now the problem with morals is the following. Where did you get them from? Where do you get your morals from? And before you get too clever and start quoting scripture to me and tell me you get your morals from the Bible or from God if you do that you're going to be trapped because biblical morality says the following women are not allowed to wear trousers Deuteronomy 22 verse 5 is clear so, so you need to be careful where you get your moral framework from okay well let them wear trousers but women are not allowed to vote. We have to agree on that at least. So you can see the problem that you're faced with. When we start talking about ethos. And you're going to tell me there are some objective morals. Tell me what they are. Thou shalt not kill. In parenthesis, except God, if, if God tells you to. And in that case, you could put your feet upon the necks of your enemies. So they can't turn the other cheek. This is why evangelical Christians only worship the God of the New Testament, not the Old. Because they see too many problems there. They see a God who's willing to commit genocide. And many other crimes. So when we start talking about morality or ethos. I want us to see 
that it's not so clear cut as you might think. I commented it on yesterday and I spoke about it in a previous meeting. When you start looking at Esau, the man Esau, and you start seeing Esau is the father of Islam, and brothers always fight, yet you love everything about what they believe and teach. Because we spoke about Sharia law. And Christians and Muslims have very similar morals. One God, Gabriel, Jesus, special worship day, headship. They love headship. When I say they, who am I talking about? Muslims or Christians? Because there's no difference. So when we start talking about our moral framework, I want us to see one point. That they are not universal. They are from my perspective. And my perspective might not be the same as your perspective. Logos. Look at the words. How universal is that? My opinion, my account, my version. When you start putting these things together, where does it bring you? When you look up the top here. Does it bring you to Revelation 13 or Revelation 11? All of these things I hope you can see funnel you in one direction. Ideology. Not humanism. So when we start using rhetoric I need to persuade you, hopefully I'm good at it, to agree with my perspective. And what does perspective mean? It's the Logos. It's my word. My version. Based upon my understanding of right and wrong and if I'm very animated and excited with pathos, you will believe me. You look at my face, you think that isn't a face of someone who would lie. No, surely not that man. He just looks too nice. Perhaps if I look different, I'd be less persuasive. The problem with all of this is that you and I, who were created from the furnace of ideology, 
think it's all normal. Because we have the truth. And if we have the truth, no one else does. And the problem is there's ten other people saying the same thing. Ten other groups. And they all go through this funnel. And they all end up looking the same. They're all special. If we can say it this way. The reason... We'll just go with the Second World War. The reason the Second World War happened is because people have ideological beliefs. One group think they're more special than another group. And what the United Nations wanted to do after they experienced those six years of mayhem and slaughter is to stop using rhetoric. Stop having ideological beliefs. Now, I don't think they have succeeded. At least not completely. If you want evidence of that, look in the, look in the mirror. Look at yourself. See how you think, how you feel, how you're constructed. But they had a worthy ideal. They wanted to take humanity. And instead of using logic, sorry, logos, ethos and pathos. They wanted to give a different model, a different standard. What's ironic about this is the only way they were going to get this to work is by using rhetoric. <laughs> if Eleanor, if uh, Eleanor Roosevelt wasn't dynamic and didn't have pathos, he wouldn't have got through. But our work is to simplify the complex things. And to put this simply. We need to switch from an ideological perspective to a humanistic perspective. And the problem is, you, however it happened, you are programmed to resist. If I read to you the 30 articles of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, I'm pretty sure you would all say, I agree. One, dot, 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 you would say yes. Two, dot, 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 you would say yes. And at the end of that, you know what you would say? I know what you'd say. But, then you'd have all your excuses. And 
and I want to say it this way. You would tell me, but if I listen to this and I accept it, do you know what the consequences of this are? Of course. It's right here. You will stop being special. And that is intuit intuitively in opposition to everything we stand for. We have an inbuilt need, an inbuilt desire to be special. Let's demonstrate that. Let's go to the Bible. Let's go to the book of... Um, let's go to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1 verse 26. And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over everything else. So there you have it. Can we all see the word? Dominion. Power. Superiority. We are more important than everything else. We're special. So I want to go to another Old Testament verse. The book of Psalms. Chapter 8. Psalms 8 verse 5. If you write that down. Or put your finger in your Bible. I want to give you another verse. This is the New Testament version of Psalm 8 5. Hebrews, Hebrews 2 7. And verse 9. Psalms 8 5, Hebrews 2 7 and 9. We'll read. For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honour. Hebrews. 2.7 is basically exactly the same. But it adds a bit at the end. And you set him over the works of your hands. And then verse 9. But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. Christ. 
crowned with glory and honour. So let's put all of this together. We did Genesis 1.26. We're special. Psalms 8, Hebrews 2. Now you might contain that to the earth. But when Alan White comments on these passages. She does it in the following way. You remember in Hebrew, sorry, in Revelation 11. I think it's verse 7, I'll check. It says that the witnesses have finished. And she says, no, it means finishing. So when she goes into these passages in Psalms 8 and Hebrews 2, she's going to make the following commentary. That human beings are made a little lower than the angels temporarily. And when you go to Hebrews 7, sorry, Hebrews 2 7, 2 7, when Jesus is master over all of the works. This is not the works of Genesis 1, just the animals. The works that are in Hebrews 2 is everything, the whole universe. So Jesus was first made lower than the angels and then he becomes the ruler of everything. So when you go from Hebrews 2 back to Psalm 8, you juxtapose them. When you juxtapose, you bring two concepts which are alien and force them together. Psalms is about you and I. So Psalms is about you and me. And Hebrews is about Jesus. And Jesus is nothing like you and me. He's God and you're not. But they get forced together because they're the same verse. But of course, Jesus is the same as us. He was made in sinful flesh. So if this works for Jesus, it works for us. If he gets crowned with glory, so do we. And when Ellen White comments on these concepts, she says the following. We are only temporarily lower than angels. Soon, we will supersede angels and we will be their boss above them. Because we're going to share the throne with Jesus, we all know that. Whether you go to Daniel 7, Revelation 5, and we'll go to Reve yeah, Revelation 5. You see that we have rulership. 
And so what happens is we have this inbuilt this fix fixation about being special. It says it in the verse. If you believe God is special, we're created in his image, therefore we must be special. And there you have all these people saying that you're not special. And so there is a tension. You have to fight against your own humanity. You need to realise that you're not that special. And it is very difficult to do that. And when you see how ideology works, it's predicated on these concepts, you need to be cognizant of the following facts. That you have your own opinion. You have your own moral framework. And your problem and mine is that your logos and your ethos are wrong. Or at least you should question them. And that's what the Universal Declaration of Human Rights does. It forces you to question your perspective. In closing, I want to say the following. I want to suggest that our message today, the Midnight Cry message, If we call it equality, and it has all these subsets, nationalism, gender, um, homophobia, organisation, is that this message teaches us that we need to become, we need to be less ideological and more humanistic. If I can just say this, we need to become more human. I, I made this point in the previous presentation. When God made Eve, and that was in Genesis two eighteen, God says, I will make him and help. Meet for him. The word meet in the English is an archaic word. It means suitable. What I suggested then and I'm repeating now. is the following point. The ideological perspective is that when God created Eve, He created a woman. And 
people do all crazy things with that. I say, I say something that's ugly. When he created Eve, the parts fit together. That's an ideological perspective. I want to suggest that when God created someone suitable, He created another human being. It's not that He created a female. That is its own story. But the primary thing God did for Adam was create another human being that was suitable for him. So it was whale with whale, human with human. And I think that's the, that's the overarching principle that we should derive from Genesis. Though you can take subtleties about male and female for sure. But it's a very narrow perspective. I'll say it another way. It's an ideological perspective. And as soon as you do ideological perspectives, which become narrow, you get funneled in a specific way of thinking. Which may seem good, And they are in certain circumstances, but they become damaging in other circumstances. And I want to suggest the following. This message is telling us to reconsider our narrow ideological perspective. And take a more human perspective. So that we can recognise that all humans are equal. They all have rights. And before you tell me you believe that. I will tell you that you're a liar. Because this movement and all of us do not believe human beings are equal. It's driven into you at a very young age. And worse, you're born that way. And therefore you need a message. To correct your thinking. We call it the midnight cry. So if you want to join me. In reconsidering how you view. Yourself and other people. Whether you're prepared. To challenge your Logos and your Ethos. And start seeing what's gone wrong in your thinking. Then join me in prayer. Heavenly Father. 
For so long, I have been in a trap. A trap that was given to me by society. A trap that I was born into. A trap that is a part of my own being. Father, I pray that you would help me to understand what the message of the hour is. So that I might come out of my warped thinking. That I might understand a new moral framework. And to really believe that all humans have the same rights. I realise I have to fight against my own nature and my own upbringing in order to succeed. I pray for strength for myself and those who are making that same commitment now. I pray in Jesus' name that you would give me the strength and the wisdom to do this. And that my brothers and sisters would also receive the same blessing. Amen.